I am an employment lawyer in Seattle, Washington, and in this video, I'm going to break down my top four red flags to watch out for in your next offer letter and why each one is so important. And stick around for my number one red flag at the end of this video because you are not going to want to miss this one. So let's get started. Number four on my list of red flags in offer letters is vague job descriptions. And vague job descriptions might seem innocuous at first, but having a vague job description is actually a gigantic problem for a few reasons. First and foremost, a vague job description can negatively impact your quality of life. It's hard to know what you're supposed to be doing if you do not have clearly defined responsibilities. And furthermore, if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, you won't know if you're doing it well. And trying to do your job every day when you don't know what you're supposed to be doing or whether or not you're doing it well can be an incredibly frustrating experience. And importantly for this video, there are legal implications too. A vague job description makes it much easier for your employer to misclassify you. And misclassification is a topic that comes up in wage claims. To learn more about misclassification, watch my video on overtime. I'll link to it in the description. But basically, certain workers are exempt from overtime requirements meaning that they don't get paid overtime or breaks. And whether a worker is exempt from overtime is determined by that worker's job duties. So if your job description is vague, it makes it much easier for your employer to claim that your job duties are exempt from overtime because your actual job duties aren't written down anywhere, so it will be your word against theirs. The next issue with vague job descriptions is that they make it much more difficult to win cases involving illegal terminations. Illegal terminations can fall into several categories, including discrimination, retaliation, and wrongful termination. But in each case, once you make your claim that you were fired for an illegal reason, the employer then gets the opportunity to argue that it fired you for a legitimate reason. And the legitimate reason that employers rely on most commonly is poor performance. And when an employer argues that it fired a worker for poor performance, the worker can overcome that argument by showing that they performed their job well. So having a vague job description makes that process much more difficult for the worker. Because how are you going to prove that you were performing your job well if there are no clearly defined job responsibilities? Let me give you an example. Say Jane Doe was fired for speaking up against sexual harassment. Well, Jane has a case of retaliation because she engaged in protected activity when she spoke up about sexual harassment and her employer terminated her in retaliation for speaking up. However, once Jane brings her legal claim, the company argues that it fired Jane for poor performance, not in retaliation for speaking up against sexual harassment. Well, if Jane's job description is super vague, she will have an incredibly challenging time proving that the company is lying because how can she prove that she performed her job well if her role is not clearly defined? Now, there are of course other ways to prove this claim. For more information on that, watch my video on how to prove retaliation. I'll link to that video in the description. But let me just say that the vague job description makes things more difficult. Okay, let's move on to the next one. My next red flag is actually a bunch of different things that all fall under this umbrella called restrictive covenants. And restrictive covenant is a legal term that you might not be familiar with, so I'm going to explain what that is. Restrictive covenants in the employment context are contract clauses that prohibit you from doing something after you leave the company. Here are the most common, but there are others too. First, non-compete agreements. Second, non-solicitation agreements. And third, non-disclosure agreements. Let's start with non-compete agreements. These are the most common restrictive covenants in employment contracts. Non-compete agreements are exactly what they sound like. They are agreements not to compete with the company if you ever leave. So you can't go work for a competitor or start your own company that would compete with this employer. And non-compete agreements are a huge red flag because they severely limit what you can do if you leave your company. Now, the good news is that policymakers generally disfavor non-compete agreements because they stifle competition. So some states have laws that prohibit non-compete agreements altogether. And other states like Washington State, where I am licensed to practice, have laws that severely limit their enforceability. In Washington State, non-compete agreements are only enforceable if the worker is making over $100,000 per year, the employer properly notified the worker about the non-compete agreement before the worker accepted the job offer, and the non-compete agreement is for a duration of less than 18 months after the employment has ended. And furthermore, as of recording this video in 2024, the Federal Trade Commission is proposing a new rule that would completely outlaw non-compete agreements. So if you are watching this in the future, non-compete agreements might be a thing of the past. Next is non-solicitation agreements. 
and these agreements are very similar to non-competes. A non-solicitation agreement is an agreement not to solicit the employer's customers or clients. And while it can seem reasonable for your employer to ask you not to steal their clients if you leave, it can severely restrict your employment opportunities, especially if your employer has a substantial presence in a particular market. Because imagine if your employer has such a large presence in a certain market that essentially everyone is their client. Now, all of a sudden, you are blocked from engaging in that market altogether. In those situations, non-solicitation agreements can have the same effect as non-competes, which substantially limit the worker's mobility and job prospects. Finally are non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs for short. And NDAs are simply agreements not to disclose certain information. And in principle, an agreement not to disclose certain information seems like a reasonable ask. Of course, an employer doesn't want you to disclose its trade secrets to its competitors, and if that's all the NDA covers, then it's totally fine. However, the problem is that most NDAs are far more broad than just covering the employer's trade secrets. And when an NDA is overbroad, it can have the same stifling effect as non-competes and non-solicitation agreements because it can overly restrict your ability to talk about certain things. And even worse, some overbroad NDAs can restrict your ability to talk about the employer's misconduct. Thankfully, in many states, we have laws that prohibit these overbroad NDAs. In Washington state, we have a law called the Silence No More Act that actually makes it illegal for an employer to give a worker an NDA that would restrict that worker's ability to talk about illegal employment practices. And if an employer in Washington state attempts to give one of its workers one of these unenforceable NDAs, the worker can actually bring a claim against the employer for violating the act. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The next red flag to look out for is a repayment provision. And repayment provisions are agreements to repay the employer for certain expenses if you leave the company within a specified period of time. And again, there are a number of different ways that repayment provisions might pop up on an offer letter or employment contract, but I will be talking about the most common two repayment provisions. First are moving expense repayment provisions, and second are training expense repayment provisions. Moving expense repayment provisions arise when an out-of-state employer offers you a job that will require you to move. As part of the offer, the employer will give you a bonus to cover your moving expenses. But the shady part is that if you decide to leave the company for whatever reason within a certain period of time, you will have to pay back the company those moving expenses, which usually amounts to thousands of dollars. And training repayment provisions operate the same way for training. By accepting the employer's job offer, the employer agrees to enroll you in costly training or certification programs. And while it can seem like a great deal at the time, if the job doesn't work out for whatever reason and you need to leave, the employer will require you to pay back the cost of training or certification, which again will amount to thousands of dollars. And these provisions are so unjust because most workers I've talked to about signing them are not even aware that they have to pay back the company until the company tells them. And then the worker is basically stuck in a job that they don't want to be in because they can't afford to leave and repay the company thousands of dollars. So with these repayment provisions, employers are essentially locking you into your position and not letting you leave. Okay, so my number one red flag and the one I caution you the most from signing is the arbitration agreement. And technically, arb agreements are restrictive covenants too, but I decided to give them their own section of this video because they are the worst agreement you can enter into as a worker. Arbitration agreements are completely unjust. But to understand why an arbitration agreement is so unjust, we need to understand what arbitration even is in the first place. So first, what is arbitration? Arbitration is an alternative to the traditional legal system. Normally, if you have an employment claim like wrongful termination, retaliation, harassment, or claims of unpaid wages, you would take your case to court where a judge and jury would decide what a just outcome should be. But with arbitration, instead of going to court, you file your claim with an arbitrator. This arbitrator takes on the role of both the judge and the jury, making decisions about your case and what the outcome should be. And this arbitration process has several inherent flaws. First, conflicts of interest. Unlike judges, arbitrators are not elected by the public or appointed by the government. They are hired by private arbitration companies, and the defendant employers select the arbitration company. So, these arbitration companies depend on defendant employers for their business, which creates an inherent conflict of interest because the arbitrators know that ruling in favor of the employer will lead to more business for them in the future. 
Furthermore, the decisions made in arbitration are generally confidential and final. They cannot be appealed like court decisions can. You see, in court, you can appeal a judge's bad decision. In arbitration, you cannot. So arbitrators have no accountability. And finally, arbitration agreements usually prohibit class claims. That means that if your employer is involved in widespread illegal practices against a large number of their workers, those workers cannot band together. Instead, each of them has to file separately, which can be prohibitively expensive and complicated for most individuals, who opt instead just to drop their claims. Because of these factors, the statistics show that workers rarely succeed in arbitration. Arbitration is heavily skewed in favor of employers, with no jury to hear the case and no public accountability for the arbitrators. This setup makes it incredibly difficult for workers to get a fair shake. So what can you do about these red flags if you spot one in your offer letter? Well, you can always try to negotiate with the employer, and if the employer really wants you, they will negotiate with you. Unfortunately, most workers do not have this kind of leverage at this stage of the hiring process. And employers will hold these provisions out as conditions of employment, so the workers face with either signing the agreement or finding another job. And if that is the position you are in and you have other job prospects, I would encourage you to consider your other options. Most offer letters do not have these kinds of provisions. Okay, so now you know my top four red flags to look out for in your next offer letter. If you see any of these red flags, think carefully about your options and what other job opportunities are out there. And if you want to know more about other nasty tricks employers play on workers, watch my video about the four signs that you are about to be fired. I will link to that video up here somewhere. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with other workers. I make videos about the laws that protect workers. The more we hold employers accountable for their wrongdoing, the more we protect other workers. That's all for me this week. See you next time.